Hi, hello, everybody. Um, oh, I have a microphone. It's like the table's so boomy. Hi. So I have this stuff laid out here, but because it makes me feel comfortable, all my stuff um, and my books that we're going to be looking at together for a little while. Um, it's great to see all of your faces here. Thank you for coming here to have this conversation with me. Hi, Troy. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm just getting used to hearing my voice on this microphone. So there'll be a little time so we can all get used to this sound for a little bit. Um, I'm sure if I talk like this, you can hear me too, right? Okay, well, that's good to know. So uh, tonight, this evening, I wanted to talk to you Houstonians about power and work and time. And when my friends from the CAM um, invited me to be a part of this 20 Hertz series, I was really excited. I was away from home working really hard and figuring out if I had the time to do it. But I really wanted to do it, so, you know. Here we are together, everybody. Everybody's here under the sound of my voice. I'm just kidding. Um, so basically, I, this is a really open conversation. I'm hoping it will be a dialogue. There is a structure where I'm gonna talk a lot and we'll all listen a lot. Um, and then there'll be question time, but if you guys are so inclined to ask a question in between, please just do, do yourself with your whole heart. So, hi Autumn. So I think about, um, I'll start with the work songs since Jamal was telling you guys about the work songs. So I was talking to Jamal and I was uh, in Italy, in Venice, Italy in 2015 for the Venice Biennale. And it was my first time there. It was my first time at the Biennale, uh, performing a new work that had never been be performed before, besides the singers that performed the same work with me this, this season, that season. Um, and Work Songs was a piece derived by my friends Jason and Alicia Moran. And it's a performance piece and a sound piece steeped in the work songs of American history, of African American history, Africans in American history. And um, in a contemporary context, we performed ritually these songs four times a week for an audience, an open audience. And uh, the piece itself was 40 minutes long. The material was very familiar. The material was very familiar and traditional in a way. Uh, what was expected of us was um, for us to be ourselves individually. And I have to tell y'all, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. But it was, um, I was there for maybe three months and it was very, it was very, very enriching. It was food. When something's really good for me and my soul, I call it food because, you know, right? <laughs> you know why. Um, it was so great. So I had that time to be out there. I had the work that I had to do um, as a performance artist, as an experimental uh, improvisational art performance artist. I was also a little bit like, oh, this is, this is gonna be easy. It's, you know, hat in the bag, is that, is that the saying? I don't know, it's a cat in the bag or one of those things. But um, easy, and, but it wasn't that easy. 
you know, after a while. The, the hardest part, actually it was always easy. I'm not even telling, remembering correctly. It was easy, but the first change that I came up to was um, a choice of, okay, so are you going to go? You know, it's a set piece. It can be wrote. It can uh, wrote like as far as routine. Or it can be new each time, you know. So the first time that I kind of extended all the cats I had in my bag, I guess. <laughs> the first time I was like, okay, well, that's it. I really like that thing I was doing the other day, so I'm gonna try that again. When I kept coming to those points is when it started to be uh, more challenging, more work was being required of me to choose to do something different with what I had. And, um, and that was a real choice. That was really a real choice. And it was, actually it was more work. But out of that, out of doing more work in that, in that way and choosing and working harder, do you guys know what I'm saying? I know I'm gonna be saying the same three words like <laughs> for 45 minutes. But you know what I'm talking about when I say work right now? in doing more work and choosing to work harder um, in the improv, I gained so much. It was, it was transformative. So it really, um, the history of the work songs it themselves um, are songs that people would use on the chain gang people that were building this country and the railroads, industrial revolution, right out of slavery times, people that had to work together in groups, but in an organized way um, to accomplish a lot over a short amount of time. These songs were vehicles, to, to vehicles of organization, really, and, and pleasant organization. Um, Okay, so that's a memory, and that kind of like really got me to thinking about this equation from school, power equals work over time. The performances themselves started to become more powerful in my life. The, the set, I had set amount of times that I was doing it, but now I'm having like, the first week I had four, the next week I had eight, the next week I had 12. So I'm having these experiences that, are, that I'm collecting and the, experience, the collection of the experiences themselves um, have their own life force just in being, memories, experiences. Um, to think about it and to talk just to I'm about to stop talking about that, but to think about it with you guys right now and to remember, it was a very short time ago. I'm, this is the time period I'm talking about is September, October, November of 2015. Um, it's such a heartfelt memory for me because I was in a space alone, even though there were people like you. I know a lot, most of y'all, but this was in Italy with the audience that I didn't really, I didn't know any of these people. And I didn't have any kind of expectation of myself, of the work, of their acceptance of me, of my work. So the only challenge that I had was in that moment, what could I find different in each performance? So it really was like super, super, Super work songs for me. It ended up being a really spiritual experience. Um, so I'm, st I'm thinking a lot about uh, power. And that word, I've been asking a lot of people, some of y'all in here, um, when you think about power, what do you think about? Oh, and that's for y'all. And disclaimer, um, because I'm facilitating this conversation. I am in no way an authority on power. I just wanna make sure that that was clear. <laughs> in no way. But I am curious about how we use this word, um, 
how it relates to work and how it relates to time. I just came back from New Orleans where I was in a residency program called the New Quorum. And it's a program for, looking for my book, it's a program for uh, music, musicians and composers. There was an esteemed composer there named Wadada Leo Smith, who um, is a founder of Creative Music ACM in Chicago. Wadada did a, led a lot of workshops. Um, I'm looking for something, sorry. Wadada led a lot of, of workshops where he ex explained to us and other participating musicians his language of music, um, how he derives his works, and then also how we could play them. So we spent a good amount of time understanding his language, going, um, trying to wrap our minds around the work itself, and then perform, creating and performing the work together. Each time it was really, really, really special. And so I asked Wadada some of his thoughts about work and time I want to share with you. So, one of the things he said is, no one shares power. You can create power. And that's, that's really, that's an interesting thought. Um, if you can't create, then what can you do? That's an interesting thought too. So another place that I went to in my, um, leisurely reading. I read an article that said promiscuous reading, so I'm trying to have different things that I can read at the same time. Um, I've been reading and working a lot with this book. This is the New National Baptist Hymnal. Um, this particular hymnal that looks like this, with this red kind of elephant, like kind of like the print on the Jordans. Um, this hymnal is the hymnal that they had in the church I grew up in, Holman Street Baptist Church. This particular, yay, Home Street. Um, this particular hymnal is out of print, but the way that it looks and everyone, you know, this one, my uncle has his name embroidered on it, but I also have one from my grandfather that has his name embroidered on it and everyone had their own hymnal and you can travel and take your own book of words with you. So I went to the hymnal and said, well, let's see what, in relation to work songs, these, these songs and the hymnals, also the spirituals, all kind of served as vehicles of organizational power and um, and the organization of time over multiple bodies. So I wanted to look in the hymnals and see what are they talking about when they're talking about power? Can anybody guess? Yes, Jamal, spiritual power, but you have an idea? The big guy, absolutely. There's a word that keeps coming up when, I can't even keep, hold on. <laughs> so I'm looking through and I'm looking at power, power, gospel, power, and the power of the blood. Yes, the power of the blood. And the power of the blood is like, the power in the gospel. There is the sovereign power, and there is the spiritual power that's talked about in, as far as a Holy Spirit, but the power of the blood is something that kind of goes into a different dimension in this religious context. The power of the blood is, uh, it, it's physical, and it binds the reader and the singer of the gospel and the reader of the gospel to it binds them to their physical self when we think about um, 
the Old Testament and um, all of the blood sacrifices of animals and sacraments and things like that. Um, and then later in the New Testament, it, ta it takes on a whole different metaphysical reality, the blood, and it becomes symbolic, which in the, sim the symbolism of the blood is what is sung about in relation to power in these hymnals. It's the blood shed by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So I was thinking, that is so... Oh, God, what's, is, is the word, I don't want to say pagan, but, you know, it's so spooky. Can I say spooky? To talk about blood all the time. And, and I'm looking, I'm looking in these books for what is the inspiration? What's the glue that's holding these songs together, that, that's holding these people together, singing these songs? And can it be a little more inspirational because... I don't think I want to be singing about blood in those situations. Um, so I'm thinking more, and my friends, my good artist friends, they gave me so many different books to, to be promiscuous with. And um, so one thought I had was this, before I talk about Bertrand Russell. One thought I had was this. And this is, I'm using this idea um, from Christianity. This is based off of my background. And this is also based closely to the background of the work songs, which was the inspiration for this talk. So you can apply your own experiences to this conversation. So I'm thinking about Jesus on the cross. And and how that is just, I'm so conflicted in this sacrifice, and now I don't have to make a sacrifice. I'm so conflicted in the power of this blood, but then I don't have to do anything with my, anyway, it's, it's really conflicting, the text, but it's, it's, it's um, gripping at the same time. So I'm thinking, in a different dimension, what if Jesus is like the heart, okay? And then the cross is like the axis, our two-dimensional axis that we are all on, our hearts being right in the middle of our bodies, of our vertical and horizontal axis. So how can, so if there's a power in the blood, where is the work? Work in a physical sense is a part of the main component of power. So if there is power in this symbolic blood, and we're starting here in the gospel, where is the work? Different hymnals, different hymns, um, gosh, I'm going to find this hymn for you guys. I just keep turning with one, one hand. But different hymns talk about the, the letting or the shedding or the spraying of the blood. This is all this, like, um, writing about the splatter. It's very visual. The outpouring of the blood. So I'm looking at the heart, and the heart is doing like this, okay? My heart and your heart is doing something like this, pretty much. And every time it goes like this, all of your blood just rushes out into your body and you breathe and you generate new cells and you are alive in that moment every time your heart goes this way. And then miraculously, with the course of the universe, your heart goes this way. And in that closure of the heart, we don't, that vacuum, that's a mimicry of exactly what's happening in space. We are, we actually are in that vacuum right now. It's holding us in form. So we have a shedding, we have a miracle, and then somewhere in between this and this 
there is a moment where nothing is happening. So I'm thinking about this moment where nothing is happening in my heart. My heart is not pumping out blood. My heart is not pulling in blood and con constricting. In that moment of non-work, what is happening? What is? How long does that happen? In that moment of non-work of my heart, is it a moment? Is there any time? I start to think that maybe with the course of the work and the pumping of this heart, that that non-moment is pretty constant. And I think about being there. Okay, that's just, that's just one thought. That same space also has to do with the working mechanism of our breathing. We're inhaling and we're exhaling and it's continuous in this life-giving flow, this life-giving work that our body is doing for us. But at every turn like of this figure eight, that's our ebb and flow of our breath, that's, a, that, that's really the rhythm of every single biological thing has this action. At every turnaround, there is a moment where my breath is neither going nor coming. It's such a small, it seems like such a small moment in time. But what if that is more than time? The moment right before the inhale, the moment right before the exhale or after the exhale. What if that is more than time? Can, can I be there? And can I be empowered in that space without technically working. So I know in the physical realm, physically, physical power needs, is physical work over time. But if we're gonna transcend and be somewhere else, will that same algorithm, will it translate? If time is a construct, in certain places, how do we start to be empowered where there is no time? These are questions that I'm thinking about. And that, that have to do with the heart. So my friend gave me this book, The Foucault Reader. Do you guys know this book, some of you? No, me neither, I don't know where. This one guy, he had this book. He's like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Here's this book. And um, it says Paul Rainbow Edition. So this book is a compilation of uh, writings by Michael Foucault. He is a philosopher. So in one chapter, he's talking about the right of death and power over life. Um, not gonna, I'll spare you guys the details, but um, he has this one concept about biopower that I thought was really interesting and I thought we could be thinking about in 2016 because it's getting so real, right? We need to be thinking a little differently. It's time, or not, we don't have any time, so, okay. Um, this is what he says. During the classical period, there was a rapid development of various disciplines. Universities, secondary schools, barracks, workshops. There was also the emergence in the field of political practices and economic observation of the problems of birth rate, longevity, 
public health, housing, and migration. Hence, there was an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations, marking the beginning of an era of biopower. Biopower. This biopower was, without question, an indispensable element in the development of capitalism. The latter would not have been possible without the controlled insertion of bodies into the machinery of production and the adjustment of the phenomena of population to economic processes. Okay, so just chew on that food for just one second. So, yeah, this is what I like. So he talks a, di he talks a lot about um, different things that developed in society around this time. This is about the 17 1700s. Beginning in the second half of the 19th century, the thematic of blood was sometimes called on to lend its entire historical weight toward revitalizing the type of political power that was exercised through the devices of sexuality. So we're bringing in some fun words. Um, what I thought was interesting is that I'm reading this and Foucault, you know, I thought it was like, okay, I'm from the South, I'm a, I was raised Christian and we are gonna talk about the blood of Jesus. But I'm reading the Foucault and they're talking about blood and everywhere you can't talk about power without talking about blood. And blood's not in this physical equation, which is what I'm really trying to share with you guys that I think in that physical equation, the blood has to do with our heart and how it works. That's really what I'm saying, okay? Um, so basically he says, blah, blah, blah. It was then that a whole po politics of settlement, family, marriage, education, social hierarchization, and property, accompanied by a long series of permanent interventions at the level of the body, conduct, health, and everyday life, received their color and their justification from the mythical concern with protecting the purity of the blood and ensuring the triumph of the race. So this idea of like um, a sovereign, a sovereignty, this idea also, I mean, we see it religiously, but we're, we're see, we see it religiously as an arm of political control. They go hand in hand. They're married. We can't really separate those two things. So um, the part that sticks out to me the most in this that I'd like for y'all to think about is these words, the permanent interventions at the level of the body. Also conduct, health, and everyday life. Permanent interventions. So there are two main, um, two distinct values that Foucault talked about when he was talking about power, and that is the individual body, primarily, and then the collective body, which is made up of individual bodies that are human. That's the part that's spectacular. We're not talking about, in theory, power over machines or even power over land and um, animals. Theoretically, and these are in these theories that I'm talking to you, talking with you about today. In a lot of these theories, 
power is fundamentally valued at the level of the human body and then the collection or collective of human bodies. So with all that aside, that's a lot of power that, um, that we each possess. To know, it was empowering to me to read in text, really old, stodgy text, philosophical text, that regardless of my person, my identity, my gender, my sexuality, my religion, regardless of all of that, theoretically and historically, my human body has power. He goes on to talk a lot about the protection of such, the, um, the cultivation of the body, the, the bigger power, which will become a sovereign power in generating more bodies, populating as a form of gaining power. Conversely, depopulating as a form of gaining power. Because power works in two major ways, archaic ways. To give life and to take away life. To give life and take away life. Life, life, life. In that, when we, when we have war, a lot of these books talk about war as the main source of power. I really thought it was interesting that it talked, I found more in preparing to have this conversation with y'all, I found more about war and militarization when looking, looking about power than I did about anything that was life-giving, like birth. Or like, you know, growth or something. It was like death. But um, death is really powerful. The fear of death is really super powerful. The fear of death is so powerful that you can get a bunch of human bodies to do the same thing. The fear of death is so powerful that you can get a bunch of human bodies to either make more human bodies or not. The fear of death, even though it's on one side of the axis, affects both positive and negative sides of the axis. So it's a win-win with the grip of the fear of death. The fear of death in my imagination, is this. When that heart closes and it's not gonna open anymore, when there won't be any more of this, there won't be any more bloodshed, flowing, there's no more flow, it's closed. Now, this could also be a death this could also be no more flow, but this doesn't seem very fearful. I don't know, it just seems like peaceful. Um, so, my, I have a couple of questions for y'all, for the universe. Okay, body, body's powerful. My body can do so much at, at the, on the cross of my body is my heart, which is working. My heart is the worker of my body. Our, our organs are working, kind of. They're working. Our brain is working, you know, luckily. But our heart has got to work. It's actually, mechanically and physically, our heart is the one that's doing it all the time, you know? It's doing it all the time. So I'm looking again before we start, all start talking together. Can you tell me what time it is, Jamal? Because now I'm like flowing in the blood of the lamb. Uh, oh, okay. 
So, um, so I just want to look again one more time at, at the idea of power equals work over time in the physical sense. It may not correlate in other areas of your life. You might not need work. You know, you might not need work to feel something in a different place. I don't, I don't know. I had an example, but I can't remember what it was. Um, okay. Like, for example, I was coming over here today, or earlier today. I was doing so much. Like, I really, I, I had ideas for images and stuff to show you guys, and I had all this extra work created for myself to show you guys. But I, it wasn't like a bad idea of work. It was something that I wanted to share, but it did require a lot of physical work, which also requires time. Okay. Now, I have some a little bit of fuel to get these things done, but I didn't have enough time. So if I didn't have enough time, it don't matter if you have the power in one way. If you have the power and you don't have the time, then, you know, what does that say about the power? Okay, so I have so much I want to share with you guys. So this is, this is one exercise. This is one, uh, two things I want to leave you with. Uh, one is, who, wh who or what, what has power over me? This is a question. Me meaning you when you're in your reflective space. What or who has power over me? What or who, my work, my work, what is my work working for? Or who is my work working for, okay? Where is my, what or who, or what or who is my time going towards? So what I want you to do in the equation is put the, the my over your power, okay? My power. What is my power going towards? What is my work or to whom is my work going towards? Or for what is my work going towards? My time, who or what? You guys get it, right? Okay. And that, I want you to do that. I'm doing it. Because I think it's important because when you, even when you're talking about my power, my work, my time, what is the effect of this, what is it for, that's real, real blood, sweat, and tears that's happening from your heart. That's your real heart power. It's not, that's not a conceptual thing like this talk. That's like limited edition so these are important questions to ask because we're talking about your heart, all right? And if there's some things where it's like, mm, my time, all my time is going towards this thing, that's your tick, tick, tick time going towards that. And there may be some other questions that might come up in your life that lead you to being happier and with a healthier heart. Um, that's one thing. And then the last thing I want to talk about, um, we can open up the floor, is love. So we're talking about the heart, and we got to talk about love. We talk about death so much. We have to talk about love. You know, um, I do think that in that flow, that's the prana, the life force, the love, that's all of that is the same thing, the energy. Also, a refresher for, I'm sure you guys know this, but in the equation, power equals work over time. Work can be, um, work can be described, is described as energy converted. So, 
you know, there's not, um, I was talking to my dad about this before I came here and he was like, oh, you mean like power and energy and time. He immediately, he just translated work into energy in his brain. But work is actually energy converted. So there's a change. Conversion means a change, basically. Conversion is a change. With one change, we have a ripple, we have a rhythm. With one change, we have three events. We have the event before the change, the change, the event after the change, which is gonna give us our sine wave, which is gonna give us our vibration of every single thing that is, you know? Which is why these work songs are so effective because they're already in the biopower and the biorhythm of our heart, where our hearts beat together. Um, so I'm thinking, I want you just to remember in your work and how you're using this word in your life, work. I have another young man that was talking to me the other day and he was saying that, I was like, what do you think about when you think about work? He was like, well, you know, I'm just gonna be at this job for a little, a little bit and then I'm gonna be moving on. I'm just trying to do, this is the, what I have to do in order to make a change happen, you know, which is, which is true, but even in thinking about your work as your job, I'd like for you guys to just remember from your heart what, what my energy being converted, who, who is benefiting? What am I doing this for? Who is benefiting from this? You hopefully are in that, in that space somewhere. Okay, and so back to love. From that, we can expand... Um, our love space from our heart. And I was doing this exercise in New Orleans and I'd like to share it with you guys, okay? It's, uh, I have never written it down. I thought this would be a good opportunity to write it down, but I'm just gonna try to say it, what I think it is, okay? If, if I tell you no, Will you still love me? And what does that say about our love? If, if I tell you yes, will you still love me? And what does that say about our love? If you tell me no, will I still love you? And what does that say about our love? If you tell me yes, will I still love you? And what does that say about my love? If I tell you no, will I still love you? And what does that say about my love? If I tell you yes, will I still love you? And what does that say about our love? And then there's so many more probabilities of that that you guys can find in your own heart space where it's just kind of a little well, a little well, I was gonna say whale a little well of prana in that, in that heart space that doesn't have to do anything, it doesn't even have to work for you. What does that say about your love in that space? Um, my dad told me, well, Trump, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to, you guys. He did, he did. My dad told me, well, Trump, he's got a lot of power, but, you know, he was like, but he don't have to work, so he have too much time on his hands. I was like, hmm. 
When I came here on Sunday or Saturday for my friend Autumn Knight's performance downstairs, I was looking around this beautiful exhibition, loving it, and a, a gentleman saw me on the other side of this wall right here, and he said to me, I don't see him, but he said, when I was growing up, if you were super, super busy, overly busy and occupied, you were called time poor. Something to think about too, time poor. Okay, so um, what do you guys think? Anybody have anything to say?